Hey, it's been a long time, but we're back with Attack of the Clones. I'm joined by Dave and Clay. How are you guys? What's going on? Doing well. Good. Well, I, I figured that um, this one will be a little bit... Uh, we I had gotten a nice on the uh, the Star Trek podcast. I want to give a very nice compliment to the show, Clay, just saying that um, they, they thought the balance of the way that we approach uh, not going too negative and also not gushing about it was a very good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was I was very pleased with that compliment. It was a very nice thing for someone to say about that show. But I, I guess this one's going to be difficult to sort of stick to that balance. So I figured we'd all start with name one thing that you think is done well. Like n- name one scene that you enjoy in this uh, Attack of the Clones film. Um, well, to- f- for me personally, uh, I can't name you one complete scene. Sure. I can give you parts of scenes. Give me a moment. <laughs> um, I think I think maybe maybe like half of the lightsaber battle with Count Dooku and Obi Wan and Anakin I'm into because <clears throat> I'm a sucker for lightsaber battles and uh, it, compared to Phantom Menace they actually did some kind of interesting uh, lighting effects and stuff which I realized watching it now was done solely to hide the fact that that it was not Christopher Lee doing the lightsabering yeah. Um, which, cause, and I, again, I say part of because part of it's really good. It's like, oh yeah, I'm into this. And then they have this weird uh, dueling close up where they're clearly just waving sticks around their heads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a and lot of stick waving. If you, um, a lot of stick waving. If you watch that, the big like arena battle. If you just, I, I got so bored, I just started looking at the Jedi in the background, and oh, yeah. it, it's absurd to just watch those people like what they're doing, like sort of. They're very just like doing calisthenics basically in the back with like sticks over their heads. And it's like, there's, wow, this is. There's an amazing gif out there of um, of the arena battle stuff before they put the effects in. So it's just a bunch of people in front of a green screen just waving sticks around. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it's um, as bad as that kid in his garage. Yeah, it, it really is. The they other, believe in it. <laughs> the other piece of a scene that I like is the second half of uh, uh, the Padme and Anakin scene after he kills the Tusken Raiders. The second uh, half of that scene. Yeah, the okay. first half of it I don't really care for, but when he like gets in her face and talks about killing children and stuff, and that we enjoyed it, that I was kind of into that. But even then, it was just like, but everything he said before that was garbage. <laughs> his entire character up to this point is just garbage. So. <laughs> He's a garbage man. Anyway. Dave, would you uh, give me a scene or a moment or a, like a a blink that you really thought an actor nailed or something like that? Oh, that's so hard. I don't even know if I have a moment that I really liked on the last. The, we watched it last night, and uh, it was just, it was miserable all the way through. I did think afterward. I was trying to think just about. So mine would be a longer one, and we can get into it over the length of this podcast. But um, everybody's so dumb, right? Yeah, like, they are. <laughs> like they don't see anything coming. And I was trying to think if Lucas did do that on purpose. Then he, he makes every hero person in the entire movie, with no exceptions, a tragic figure in that they just keep screwing up and they don't get what their own problems are and they, they destroy the galaxy that way. So thinking about it that way, if, you, if he was trying to make every good guy a tragic figure in like the classical sense, I mean, it's kind of cool. Not that the execution worked, but it's a decent idea. Yeah, that was that was actually the thing that I noticed when we were watching it is like if you break this movie down – into uh, what's ha- like if you if you take what's happening independently of the context of everything, it's not terrible, uh, but it's clear that the 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 ways that it would be good are not the intended ways. So, for instance, I was watching it and and I was thinking, oh, Anakin, he's so insufferable and he's whiny, and I kind of was if when I took him out of the situation, I was like, okay, well, he's being he's a teenage kid. And uh, he's trying to deal with these hormones. He's acting really creepy and weird and kind of rapey towards Padme. <laughs> and this is this is actually kind of an interesting character thing. But then you put it back into the movie and you realize, well, that's not what they were going for. That was just the only way he knew how to write that character. Yeah, yeah. And right. it doesn't – and the same thing with Count Dooku. Dave and I were talking about Count Dooku because there's that point where Dooku says to uh, – I know we're jumping way ahead. But uh, Dooku says to uh, Obi-Wan um, – what the hell does he say, Dave? He he basically uh, uh, makes he he has uh, his idea of of, of uh, um, being able to to uh, go outside of the light side and the dark side. He kind of 
makes a uh, an offer to Obi Wan, and we both kind of looked at each other and were like, "Oh, is he sincere about that? Because if so, that's actually really cool." But then obviously he's not sincere about that at all. I, I yeah, he was I saying, you know, I, you, you guys are all fooled. The the Republic is run by a Sith, which it is, and like right. if they had just stuck with that, that would be awesome. I th- I think that um like I was gonna say that I really like Christopher Guest just because he seems to be the only person who's capable. Guest? Uh, what, Christopher what? Lee. Lee, I'm sorry. <laughs> Christopher I wish Guest Christopher would Guest was in this movie. <laughs> Christopher it would, it would Guest make would a very different movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Best in uh, the galaxy. Yeah. So uh, Christopher Lee um seems to be the only actor who is like I'll try to portray some emotion in what I'm doing here uh, That's because he's fucking awesome. Every line reading he has, you you get the sense that he seems sort of conflicted about what he's done. Right. Um, like and like, oh, that makes sense. I don't think that's ever written into the script. I think it's him just taking something that isn't there and going with it. And I think that like I'd to to the things that the the movie does right. I think it's kind of just like a a broken clock is right twice a day kind yeah. of thing. Like he uh, some of the things is just going to work out. Like I thought that was good and. I, I don't even mind the scene where Shmi Skywalker dies. I think it's not great, but it's like okay, this is this is something. Um, yeah. And then you know, and Anakin comes storms out of the little Tuscan tent or whatever, and, mm-hmm. and lays waste. It's like oh, that's that's pretty decent. Um, but I, I can, remember. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say I remember when when I saw this the first time as a kid. That whole sequence was my favorite part. That because that cause, honestly. It was my favorite part because now that I'm thinking back, it's the only part where something interesting happens. Yeah. Well, after you know, a combined, like, if you include Phantom Menace, it's like three and a half hours. Now he's starting to turn into Darth Vader. It's like, finally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are, it's, not even, it's not even that he's starting to turn into Darth Vader. It's just that he's actually taking some action. Yeah. You know? And, and he's making a decision that isn't just, oh, well, I jumped out of the car again. <laughs> I hate when he does that. The uh, <laughs> Yeah, the uh, I was talking to Dave before you got on Skype uh, here, Clan. I was just I was saying that I think this movie has the most scenes of someone like packing luggage into a futuristic <laughs> vehicle and getting out because Anakin and Padme get into like thirty-seven different vehicles that are taking them from point A to point B, and it's so boring. I can't believe I can't believe how long this movie is. Quite my frankly, f- my favorite part of all of that it's is when um, when Obi Wan steals the speeder. Uh, or Anakin steals the speeder to go after the to uh, the bounty hunter, oh, and the, you actually car chase. you. But before that, once he gets into the car, you actually get to watch him put the car into reverse, <laughs> and three point turn to get out of the parking space <laughs> the, before he joins the chase. Yeah, so let's talk about this. This movie, to me, watching it through, I, first, yeah, first I couldn't believe that this movie is two hours and fifteen minutes. It's absurd. Oh, it's uh, not the, a short movie. But I mean, a lot of it. Almost every scene to me seems to be like it's a. I was thinking walking. They lots seem, of walking. They seem like tech demos of like a fan service that is like kind of into computers and wants to make a like a movie. Of, yep. there's, there's like a Star Trek series. I think it's called Renegades, which is like a fan made series. Mm-hmm. It feels like that where every scene to me just sticks out as Lucas wanted to put this person into it, like the chef that Obi Wan asks for information. Yeah. Th- there's no point for that. The um. The the fact that the assassin right at the very start, mm-hmm. what's the point of that person being a changeling? That's we what had, we noticed when yeah. we watched it last night too. Like she never. So first off, I I was pissed off when we saw that movie because through four movies, Star Wars had never used the trope of uh, a shapeshifter in sci-fi, and like everybody else has that, and Star Wars never did it. And then they did it with zero purpose. They just threw it in there because they could. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and she it, never uses the shape shifting. It seems to just she loses her ability to maintain her slightly Asian form and reverts <laughs> into like a lizard person. But even when they go into the club and they're like, "We're looking for a shape shifter," she doesn't change into another person. No, exactly. <laughs> and even if she did, she's wearing the same fucking clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and then Django just assassinates her. But yeah. I mean, so can so, so why doesn't Django shoot the Jedi? Because he, he, he shoots, they didn't see it coming. He shoots her, kills her because she's about to talk. He could have just killed the Jedi. And the other really dumb thing by the time you get to that movie that pissed me off watching it this time is the banter during the car chase scene. So, like, he, oh, you lost your lightsaber again. And, like, he jumps off the side of the car and Obi-Wan has to say, like, I hate when he does that. 
And what's annoying about it is when that thing is done in movies, it, especially in the beginning of a movie, it's to show the audience that the two characters know each other really well and they've been yep. adventuring together. But we already know this because it's the second friggin' movie in the series. Yeah, right. The other thing that they do that I can't stand is uh, when they have conversations about things that happened off screen that we never see. Like, so when they're in that elevator and he's like, remember that time that you fell into that nest of Gundars or whatever? And they're like, oh, yeah, that was weird. <laughs> I, I hate that shit because it's, it's doing the exact same thing as you're saying, Dave. It's, it's, it's like, it's like um, there's a way that uh, uh, lazy writing um, characterizes characters that I can't stand because it stands out so much um, is when you have another character tell someone about the, so like if you if if you had uh, um, Star Wars right, and you don't meet Han Solo or you do meet Han Solo but you don't really learn anything about him and blah 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 blah, but then you have a scene where uh, Obi Wan Kenobi tells Luke how bad tells Luke about how badass Han Solo is, that's always lazy a sign of lazy writing because they're not bothering to show you how much of a badass he is. Like imagine if they met Han Solo in the cantina right, and then Han and Chewie leave. And then uh, Obi-Wan turns to Luke and says, that guy's not to be messed with. I one time saw him stare down Greedo and shoot him cold, <laughs> cold-blooded in the face. And, you'd, and Luke would be like, oh, my God. And the, uh, the audience would be like, oh, yeah, he must be a badass, which is way lazier than if they actually showed you the damn thing. Yeah, yeah. It, Lucas, Lucas loves to talk. Uh, Luca, or Lucas loves to explain the stuff that's going on, which I guess ties into my big problem I, I was thinking this, and you let me know what you guys think. I would love to show these movies to someone who's totally unfamiliar with Star Wars because what I think is kind of a common problem, if you're familiar with the story, and especially the, story, the way the story's supposed to go, because these are the prequels to the original trilogy, you kind of just gloss over what's actually going on in the movie because you're like, oh, it just kind of has to, like, he has to get there. It has to get to that right, point. Right, right. I was trying to watch this. I don't understand what the plot is in this movie. Yeah, I don't understand the why the problem. clone the clone troopers are um, attacking the robots. Did Dooku organize everything, and now they're just wiping out both armies? I don't understand I don't what's know. going on. The uh, um, the thing that I said to Dave afterwards is I was trying to backtrack the story and figure out. Oh, so if the point of the entire story here was to have uh, this jumpstart this war. Um, which would give Palpatine supreme executive power, and then he would, you know, say, "Oh, I want a uh, an army or whatever." Um, what happens if, like, is 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 killing is the only way this happens? Uh, what am I trying to say? Okay, so if if the if Jango Fett doesn't kill the bounty hunter, which doesn't set Obi Wan down the path of trying to find all the stuff and re revealing everything, right? What's the catalyst for for the plan? Right. <laughs> or was yeah, the cat yeah. is the catalyst for the plan killing Amidala? Because I could see that being it, maybe. But even then, if they kill Amidala, they don't know who killed Amidala. But Amidala is just trying to be assassinated because the trade guys still have a vendetta, right? Yeah. So I think. I, so why does Dooku give a fuck about? Like, I don't understand what Dooku is trying to assemble here because I thought Palpatine was trying to get the clone army. Which right. is supposed to be superior to the robot army, even though the robot army seems capable of mowing down people at this point. Um, right. So I don't understand. If Palpatine just wants the clones, was Palpatine not the one talking to the cloners? Who are they talking to? I was under the impression that Palpatine was not involved in the... I think I assumed that they were talking to Dooku. Okay. Because... And because, he's calling uh, himself... Tyrannus. Oh, but the the cloners call him something else. They oh, call that's, him yeah, the the guy who died years before, whatever. Yes. Yeah. Who um, who the the Jedi when his name comes up give each other sideways glances as if right. as if that means something, but it's never it's never clarified. Well, they just they go into uh, Obi Wan sends the transmission back and he drops the name and then Obi Wan says I was under the impression he had died ten years before this supposedly it all started. <clears throat> yes. So. Um, and then when he talks to Django, Django says he answers to a, um, a guy named Tyrannus. But now that I'm thinking about it, there's no point in the movie where either of those names are tied back to Dooku. I mean, it, it's implied, but... Dooku, he, uh, 
Sidious calls him Tyrannus at the oh, end. Oh, he does. Yes. Okay, never mind yep. then. Yep. I had my eyes had rolled back into my head. By that. <laughs> it's, I I just I don't understand for how long this movie is. It's clearly just killing time until it gets to the third movie, which is where everything actually happens. Which is it's such a shame because they had so, such an opportunity here. I think what Lucas was trying to do with this movie was. Like we're talking about, the, the movie's about, the, the plot behind it is political intrigue. But he exposes himself as not knowing that much about politics mm-hmm. or, or warfare when he explains the story of what's going on. Because to believe the story, you have to believe that every single person in the Republic has no idea what they're doing and just doesn't see the obvious coming. And, um, and, and we noticed, what was the dumb line? That we noticed about, uh, they say something like, you know, they basically admit that they can't use the force for. Oh force yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's and that's that supposed to explain away why they're so dumb yeah. and can't see what's coming in front of them. But like, the force doesn't, you know, not having the force doesn't mean you're just a stupid person and can't make strategic <laughs> or, decisions, which none of these guys can do. Right. I mean, the the thing is, if he, if he had set the movie up where the Jedi were becoming too high and haughty and like on the high horse, you'd be like, oh, like their undoing was thinking that they were like, th- that's an interpretation. I think I've seen that online, but it's it's never said in the movie that this is what the case right, is. Yeah. They're just like, is still supposed to be like the wisest. And so, so is Mace Windu. And they're they're just flat out wrong. Mace, Mace Windu time. in this movie is horrific, except for the scene where he charges Jango Fett, which is kind of <laughs> cool. But Mace Windu has the, it ties into what you guys are talking about at the, uh, the beginning scene where Palpatine is like briefing the Jedi. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he, he does a thing that is just to set the plot into motion. And I don't understand why he would do it. He's like, why doesn't Obi-Wan watch Queen Amidala? Uh, and then Mace Windu says, yeah, he just got back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's he's clearly just such an idiot, like exposing oh, like, everything that the Jedi have as Palpatine is winking in front of him. The, right. the idea that um, Yoda, especially, who seems to be is supposed to be, you know, uh, the best of the best and in touch with all of these different things <clears throat> and aware of anger and hatred and these heavy, heavy emotions. The idea that he would be like, you know what? I think Anakin should be the one who uh, um, goes with Amidala. There's nothing that could possibly go wrong there. Everything, he seems pretty level-headed. Like, who would make... There's no possible explanation <laughs> that he would make that call. No, it's it's not like the Jedi is stretched thin, you know? It's no, like there's, there's no apparently reason. a billion of them. <laughs> and they all they all just go down real easy, yeah. I, That's another thing I have to talk about later, but okay. When, when the going. Jedi die, yeah. I just, I had, I just really... I think it's just because I know where the story has to go. I just accept sort of blankly what's happening on the screen yeah, here. Yeah. And I, if anyone can actually explain to me how the how this plot is, what Palpatine is trying to do besides get his clone army, which this seems the most convoluted way to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing that makes sense in his arc to me is getting supreme executive power. Right. That makes sense. I uh, one of the things I said when we were watching this is I wish all of these prequels had just been about had been from Palpatine's point of view. Yeah, I think they would have been a much more interesting story. Yeah, I think so too. He's he's by far the, I mean the most interesting. Like I don't know, there's something about him that's the most interesting at this stage where everyone else seems kind of boring. Yeah, especially when you know even if you take a step back and you go, all right, well. <clears throat> the the Star Wars prequels have to be about Darth Vader, right? They have to be about well, theoretically, they have to. It's what everyone wants to see. They want to see for some reason. They want to see Anakin Skywalker turn into Darth Vader, right? But you know how that story is going to end. Anakin Skywalker eventually turns into Darth Vader. There's the, what you're you're at a disadvantage right from the start. Yep. But if you shift the focus to Palpatine, you have no idea how he ends up as the Emperor. Right. You know, you, the, you, you know that at some point uh, um, uh, Vader or uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin fight, Anakin gets fucked up, and then he gets put into the suit. But Palpatine is a clean slate, basically, before, um, bef- before he shows up for the first time. So I think seeing him starting out as a senator and, and what turns him evil would have been a really nice curveball because you can still do all the Vader stuff because it's still in there. But you have much more of an interesting blank slate of a character to play with in Palpatine, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd agree with that. I mean, he's he he has the. I mean, he's he sort of has had an arc. It's been a while since we watched Phantom Menace, but I mean, his 
his arc is clearly explained like every single step mm-hmm. that he's taking it i don't think it always makes sense but it, it, like his general progression makes sense um yeah. the republic as an institution has ceased making sense so these separatists that dooku is in control of right <laughs> what is this like what how are how how do they even pay off in the ultimate over over story you know like in the grand scheme of where this is going are they mentioned in the next movie is this ever brought up again uh they they blow up the trade federation ship in the third one is the trade federation leading the separate i guess that's what we're supposed to i guess so so there there was like a uh you know uh a a federation of separatists because they go around the table Remember? Yeah. And it's oh, like yeah. there's Dooku and then there's the, <laughs> the, the, the robot techno guys. <laughs> the techno union. Yeah. <laughs> and after <laughs> he, he um, did, the guy does the annoying thing he's talking and then fiddles with his knob for no reason, well, he, so you miss re- half of what he says. He refers to himself as as the techno union and then he like <laughs> drops a beat in on his chest <laughs> turntable. <laughs> yeah, it's uh that's I mean I, I I was just thinking about, well, what kind of republic is this that they're basically like enslaving people who don't want to be a part of the republic? You know, yeah. like w- what's the uh, what's the angle for these separatists as opposed to yeah. being in the republic? And and that's well, that's why I said like he George Lucas kind of exposes himself as not knowing what he's doing, in that like you know the the things about politics he never gives a backstory he never gives a motivation to why anybody wants to separate except that they just blindly follow this guy Dooku and it, it just it, it kind of falls apart and stops making sense when nobody has a motivation to do anything and it's just you as the audience have to just go along and be like okay well they must have a reason but he never t- never tells you what the reason is yeah and I mean and in the He's original, not interested. the original trilogy the motivation was just always very personal you know right He's just he's yeah. branching off into this huge epic scope that just ultimately is not making a lot of sense. So uh, let's talk about Dooku is not mentioned in Phantom Menace, right? He just kind of no. appears in this one. Yeah, they, he just is a convenient plot plot element. <laughs> he's he's got a great name. Um, I don't know why he's a count. I guess he seems to be an ex Jedi. Uh, he's the most his potential for what they could have done with someone who doesn't fall into either light or dark. Could have been really interesting. Um, but no, that's just a, a game Lucas is playing in the script. He is ultimately revealed to be a dark side apprentice. Um, I kind of like the Dooku idea. He just He's clearly just there because they killing off Maul was a problem for them. And they needed yeah. to replace the dark side apprentice immediately. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know much else there is to say about him. Did you guys have any sort of general thoughts about his character? But... Other than he's just he's just kind of there, and he gives a decent performance, but ultimately, and he has a uh, a bent lightsaber, which we've never seen before, so that's very <laughs> fascinating. Well, so Chris, Christopher Lee's awesome, but um, I had thought of this earlier. Like, if if there was, you know, if if that character was in the original three movies, I would have wanted to know, and I would know like what he's the count of, and like I'd know his backstory. He's just just totally unintriguing. He just I don't, I don't care. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't care about Kantuku. He is entirely a plot mechanic, and like to a to a level of primary draft writing that I've never seen. This whole this whole movie feels like you know they just shot the first draft of the script. No one reacts to his name in a way that you'd be like, the Jedi all seem to know about him, but when his name is brought up, they're not like, oh my god, Count Dooku. Uh, there's like they're just so disinterested in his story in in the movie, and it's just very funny to me. Yeah, uh, there's no. I mean, uh, it would it would actually have been even more interesting if uh, <clears throat> if he just actually turned out to be that guy they thought was dead. Yeah, you know, yeah, like right. it, why does why does that have to be a cover name? Why can't it just be? Oh no, I you thought I was dead, but that was all part of my plan or some shit like that. Yes, it, yeah. it instantly makes him <laughs> more intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> just because he's been talking to somebody. So you guys are both of the opinion that Darth Sephanitis or whatever, wh- who's talking to the cloners, <laughs> that was Dooku the entire time? I assume so, yeah. My only other way of looking at it, I'm sorry I'm hung up on this, but that whole that whole sequence doesn't make any sense to me. It, it really doesn't. Because 
what the other thing I thought might have been happening was that what do you remember what the guy's name was that they said was talking to them? I don't know. It's like Stephanitis or something like that. If he had actually been talking outside of the Jedi Council to those people and he had actually set that plan into motion and then Palpatine learned about it or something. Yeah. Does that make sense? Is that but it, the movie doesn't explain why that Jedi would have been doing this in the first place. I My understanding of, of the plot of this movie is that <clears throat> Palpatine wants supreme executive power, and he thinks that the way that he can do that is by jump-starting a war. So he, behind the backs of everybody, is has started growing this clone army because he knows eventually once things are set in motion he's going to need an army the th- which but it's still and it's it's still so fucking dumb well is because, dooku is dooku aware of that or is dooku being played as well no i see i had the same thought but i believe that dooku is aware of that because okay. yeah i think the final scene between dooku and palpatine makes that clear that like He's in on it. So Dooku yeah. is, they didn't need to do that. Dooku is putting himself in grave danger for no particular payoff. Basically, yes. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah, no just particular the apprentice. Yeah, no particular payoff we're clued into anyway. Yeah. You know? um, but I was going to say th- that whole thing doesn't make any sense because, like, the Jedi know about this secret clone army that already has some strikes against it, right? Hey, it took Obi Wan a, a good twenty hours to figure out what a fucking five year old needed to tell. Oh him. god, that scene! Oh my god! That, oh, and his investigation, like, how dumb is it? He just walked in and they told him everything. Just, just I mean, that, to whole, him. that scene where he goes in to the where the Padawans are learning, who are adorable, by the <laughs> they way. They are adorable. This, yeah. This, I mean, that one, the red and white one, is just absolutely adorable. And one but, of them is named Liam, and he shuts the the curtains. <laughs> But hey, that scene is so fucking idiotic because you've had two scenes before that of Obi-Wan not understanding how files can get deleted from something. Yep. And then he goes into Yoda's place and asks Yoda and is like, I don't know. Uh, what do you think, kids? And then one of the kids says, maybe someone deleted the file. <laughs> and then Yoda goes, ah, the kids, they're always smarter than you think. Why didn't we think of that? They probably deleted the file. And then Just, um, yeah. just go where the deleted file says not to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing with um it kind of ties it was kind of maybe it was a nice callback in um Force Awakens when they they have the tiny bit of the map that's missing. I did no, I did notice that. And it's just like, well, why don't you just search this area that you clearly have a very small slice of the galaxy. I know it's still a galaxy, but this is fucking Star Wars. I'm sure you could, you know, blanket search that area. We um, know you have probe droids. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And he, uh, Skywalker's just will wait for that podcast, but he's just standing on the mountain. He's not hiding anywhere <laughs> yeah. for a long time. <laughs> but uh, but uh, just to finish finish my uh, train of thought, please. Um, that whole thing, you know, after that doesn't make any sense because the clone army already has strikes against it, right? Everything that he tells the Jedi in that um, uh, 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 report that he sends back, yeah. it's like, oh yeah, there's a clone army here that's being built for someone who claims to be a Jedi who's already dead. Um, and, and it's the guy that they based them all on is a bounty kill, bounty hunter who I think is probably the guy that tried to kill the queen or the senator. <laughs> right. I had a very a awkward three one. minute conversation with him where it's, yeah. he seemed not on the up and up. <laughs> who says that he answers to a guy named Tyrannus and that can't be good. <laughs> and then at the end of the movie, when they need an army, Yoda is commanding this army that they know is just like. It's there's clearly some underhanded shit going on here, yeah. but they have no problem just being like, oh yeah, you know what? We we need an army. Just so happens there's a clone army being built for people who we can't really pin down who put this in motion. We may as well use it. It's already there. It's it's right here. You might as well just throw it out there. Can you get oh. that clone army to Genosis in one hour? We <laughs> sure can. <laughs> <laughs> We've got ships that fire straight laser bolts that'll just cut through everything. There's so much garbage in this movie that's just like. It's plot mechanic garbage. Well, it's funny because, you know, we just were laughing about how Obi-Wan is too much of an idiot to figure out that he should just go to the deleted spot where the star is not uh, and yeah. he'll find it. Um, he his, On the other hand, he basically becomes Sherlock Holmes. When he meets Django, he puts so much shit together immediately <laughs> with very little evidence because that conversation between Django and Obi-Wan is is very tense but there's no reason for it to be tense you know what i mean like what's i don't understand what Django's angle is on that 
uh, because they talk about nothing. He's just like, yes, they have my, this is my clone army. And Obi-Wan's, it's a very fine clone army. And then they it's, stand a foot away from each other and look at each it's other's like eyes. One of those, it's like one of those scenes from The Naked Gun where they play really uh, um, uh, uh, foreboding music behind it. And they the acting is really foreboding and like suspicious. But the stuff they're talking about is just really bland. Right, and ordering a sandwich or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's base. He, he from that scene he puts together the fact that he does not see the equipment, you know, because right. the boba hides it. So he doesn't see that this guy looks like the guy who shot the other assassin. He just kind of assumes it, and then he sends back that report, and then he goes and has one of the sloppiest fights I've ever seen. <laughs> ever Oof. seen where he fights Jango Fett, and they are both slipping in wet rain, and it, people, look, it looks horrible. People love that fight. I don't understand why. Jango does either. not come out looking good in this. He does a lot of diving for stuff and not getting it in time. There's, there's a great scene where, where Obi-Wan pulls his jetpack off and he just face plants <laughs> right into the edge of the building. <laughs> it's it's terrible. I mean, Jango is such a... I mean, he's, he's clearly just to insert the Boba thing. Um, we get some great one-shots of Boba saying, yeah... Uh, as they're pretending to shoot at Obi-Wan in space, <laughs> which makes me cry. Um, and it's too bad because I think the Django actor is actually pretty good at what he's supposed to be. Yeah. yeah he's pre- pretty solid at that, but it's it's, uh, it's interesting. I don't know. Anyone have uh, some big thoughts they had uh, while watching this or anything you realized on your recent the, rewatch? One of the big blot- blots in it is uh, is Yoda. Take Yoda in Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back, and he's like, he's this wise sage. He says smart things. He's really cool. You don't know much about him. In Attack of the Clones, he they show him in one movie teaching children, being the best sword fighter in the galaxy, which they don't just show you. They have to tell you that he's the best yep. sword master in the galaxy. And he's commanding an army, which, as Clay said earlier, makes no sense. And here's why. The Republic has never had an army. So Yoda has never seen an army, and suddenly he's in command. Why did he take command of it? Why did they give command to a Jedi, and why is he a good commander? And why did he accept the command? Like, none of this makes sense. Yeah, and, and why did the Jedi run in front of all of them as they're running into yeah. battle? They, should, they yeah. should be in the rear. I did like the fact that apparently uh, this army uses the ray guns from the Godzilla movies when they <laughs> shoot things, because that was awesome when they shot oh, that. I- I did like that one scene where they were kind of uh, the clones were marching towards the robots uh, in like a dust storm. Yes, that was that a, was, that was a good cool. shot. That was a good shot. That was a good shot, right? But uh, again, the warfare in the movie makes no sense. It's yeah. the same exact thing that they did in Episode One, where it's just two gigantic armies of infantry running at each other and shooting their blasters as many times as they can. Like, yep. it's it's just dumb. And I, I think that the the robot the robot army puts up too good of a fight like if you're trying to sell me on the fact that the clone <clears throat> army is superior to the robots which i can i can buy into like there must be some logic behind it they they don't really show that i guess eventually they're the last man standing but it's because i assume that the separatists have been defeated so thoroughly i, I don't know yeah. it, it felt it felt weird to me um there's actually you know for the amount of uh uh, uh tacked on um adhesive dialogue that is in this movie, like we've already talked about. Like sand um, in your vagina or whatever uh, Anakin <laughs> is talking about. Yeah. No, just like, you know, plot mechanic dialogue like that, uh, um, uh, the saying that they can't use the force as well anymore, which I'll get to that in a second. But um, I feel like the dynamic of the end could have been fixed so easily. So <clears throat> they have the scene where Palpatine gets his supreme power, right? And he says, the first thing I'm going to do is create an army. And then they pull back to Windu and Yoda. And I forget even what they say. If they had said, you know what? We need to get to Geonosis and finish this before that army can be put together. Yep. That at least adds some tension between the two things that are going on here, right? Right. And then if they – or and when you get to the Geonosis stuff, don't have them be the same – like have the Jedis get there – and then have the army come in and just start blowing everything up, you know? Like, have there be some sort of tension. Don't have Yoda flying in on a fucking Huey like uh, Colonel <laughs> Kilgore in Apocalypse Now. Saving the day. I, yeah, I can I can appreciate that. It's There's no... 
there's no tension between those two storylines. Unfortunately, the Jedi are just playing into their ultimate demise. Um, and like, what is the what is their motivation at all? Like, I I can't. They just exist. Like, they're part of the Republic, but like, they're apparently subservient to the Republic because when the Republic brings an army up, they're like fine with it. Like, but they feel like they're losing. Power. Like, I don't know what the dynamic there is at all. Right. Yeah. 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 If it's like a separation of power thing. So, and I, mean, I don't think Lucas even cares. Like that. <laughs> he's yeah. making a political intrigue movie, and he doesn't even care about that. Well, yeah. Dave, you brought up a good point last night when you said that the entire Obi Wan plot is him unraveling a mystery that we know the we inherently know the answer to. Right. Thanks to you know, already 30 years of, of, of knowing who the bad guy is. So it's like incredibly boring because he's unlocking pieces to a mystery that who gives a shit? You already know what the answer is. Yeah. Right. Very slowly. He spends the entire movie basically on that quest, except for the end where he's, you know, fighting or whatever. But right. it, that's just, it's such a slow, it's such a slow reveal of information. He's going to these characters you'd never meet before, just the CGI chef who knows about this thing, and you'll send him over there. That scene is inexplicable. Yeah. Why didn't he go to a weapons expert to learn about the... Why did he have to be a chef? <laughs> In a 50s-style, like, Cafe 80s from Back to the Future 2. <laughs> with, with a, Goro on. With a sassy waitress who says you want a cup of joe, hon. Uh, I don't <laughs> understand. I don't understand. <laughs> it's It's... I'm just amazed at how little happens here. Like, I understand, like, Palpatine's rise is very important. The clone army is important. And I do think that uh, when you watch it and you see that the clone army are the stormtroopers is is a decent reveal. You know, you kind of know what's happening, but it's cool to see them in the helmets and they're, like, marching around to a slightly imperial theme. Um, It just, it's it's such a, a weird... It's weird that Lucas chose not to focus any storyline on how this was the Jedi falling, really. They just kind of happenstance. Like, they just walk into this situation. And it doesn't really pay off in any way. It's just very frustrating to uh, have to sit through. Especially two hours of it. Um, I will say And and it cheapens the Emperor, too. Because I I was trying to think, like, did Lucas do this intentionally? Are these just tragic, you know, victims? But, like, you know... Take Return of the Jedi. The Emperor, everything the Emperor does up until Han Solo blows up the shield generator is like everything goes according to the Emperor's plan. And the Emperor's plan is cool, and you don't see it coming. But when the plot revolves around just everyone else just being a fucking idiot, like it cheapens <laughs> what the Emperor does. Yeah. His plan's going yeah. according to, you know, everything's going according to his plan, but kind of by accident. He, it's not I, his fault. It's I'd everyone like, else's fault for being dumb. He's not like winning. See, they're losing. Uh, I'd like to see Lucas linger on the shots, like after the seventeenth scene where the Jedi are talking to Palpatine in his office. Like, if the camera just lingered after they left, and he's like, "I can't believe this is working." They're just sitting at that his desk and they're like, "This is going perfectly to plan." I can't can't even believe it. Yeah, his um, I, I it's amazing. Like, he doesn't even try to write in any sort of why why giving someone executive power can't just be immediately removed. You know, right. like, where's the logic there? I guess the clone army is going to blindly follow his orders or something, but... I well, I, I, th- I think it kind of uh, exposes something, uh, again, it exposes something Dave was talking about, in that Lucas doesn't really know what he's talking about. Right. Like, we, we were kind of joking when we were watching it, but it's it feels 100% true. He's just using words that he knows. Yeah. Like, he doesn't understand any of the politics he's throwing down like we were we had a really uh uh, uh it, we, we laughed for quite a while when um amadala talks about how she had experience in something else when she was working as a public servant <laughs> dave goes you mean as a fucking queen <laughs> <laughs> i i left it apparently their queens are elected for no particular reason yeah that's what i mean he's just throwing words at the wall yeah. He just has no concept of like I was trying to figure out why is she not queen anymore? Why is this other woman queen? Why is she did she get did she get a uh, uh, promotion she says to it in senator? The beginning too. In the beginning of the movie, she says she gives some stupid speech about making democracy work. Yep. yep. A- and and then she says it to to Anakin again, like, well, that sounds like a dictatorship. And Clay goes when we're watching it, like a monarchy. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, they, they, you, you guys didn't enjoy their subtle. 
um, thing where Anakin's like, well, sometimes you just need a person in there who's going to make uh, <laughs> yeah. make things happen. And it's, he's, right. I, I need to talk about Anakin Skywalker is clearly unhinged, right? Like when he, yeah. Like oh, yeah. Padme, oh, yeah. Padme falling for him is absurd because he's clearly, every scene with him, he's this crazy person who, like, I'd be like, Clay, how's your, uh, How's the fruit salad at this barbecue? And you'd come up, you're like, you're not going to fucking believe what this, like, this guy, <laughs> I, I was doing my taxes, and this fucking guy came up. It's like, whoa, whoa. We, we're this not fruit talking salad, about, we're not, this fruit salad <laughs> is holding me back. <laughs> we're not talking about that at all. He so, he so quickly goes into blaming Obi-Wan and just blaming everything, and you get no sense of that. Although I, I do feel Obi-Wan's a little bit of a dick to him, but it's because yeah. he deserves to be a dick. I do have to say, uh, Obi Wan throws a lot of shade at Anakin in dialogue, where he's like, "No, you can't do that. You're just a fucking kid," and like lots of lots of like really passive aggressive stuff. Good job rescuing me, Anakin. Like yeah. when he's chained, yeah, that kind of stuff. But but again, I mean, it's all just him saying stuff to Anakin. Is there's no <laughs> action involved? No, there's not. It, it, like the and I was thinking of that too because his whole turn is like Obi Wan's holding me back. But when you know, you know, having a girlfriend is forbidden for a Jedi, and he he explicitly tells Obi Wan like, "I have a huge crush on this Padme girl," and Obi Wan's just like, "Well, be mindful of your feelings." <laughs> yeah, Obi Wan seems pretty cool about the whole thing. Well, he's got much longer hair. He's clearly into the, <laughs> just that kind of a, that kind of a, a lifestyle at this point. I just I hate every single Obi Wan Kenobi. All about just hardcore fucking. <laughs> I hate everything about. The Obi Wan Anakin interactions, like if you so if you bad. want this to be the story, and it culminates, we're not there yet, but it culminates in I think that their final fight scene is so terribly done on like all levels, but we'll That's get to that. Um, it's just like I understand he's he's skipping a lot of time, so he has to have these dialogue scenes where he just explains the differences between these characters. Like I just. Obi-Wan doesn't react to when they have their meeting with Padme or Amidala or whatever at the very start and Anakin immediately goes against what Obi-Wan is saying in the meeting. Mm -hmm. Obi-Wan reacts as if this has not been that big of a deal where this seems like a colossally where everyone else in the room is looking at each other going what the hell is going on. Obi-Wan seems totally clueless to how bad of a thing this is for everyone involved. Uh, It's just it strikes me as very odd. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know. uh... <clears throat> if if in what direction was given to any of these actors um cuz there's it's not yeah you don't get any idea of character or any idea of relationship through any of their actions or rea- reactions or anything like that it's all just the stuff that they're saying the first uh the first Anakin and Padme scene where she's packing because they're fucking suitcases in half this movie she's like on the bed packing clothes and he's talking about uh something and then the scene ends with she walks away towards the camera and he turns to the camera and gives this look. Um, mm-hmm. Amy was like, is that him turning to the dark side or is that his lusty look? And I could not answer <laughs> what, what that look actually was. So, so I, I think, is, is it about time that we address this relationship that they, they are trying to push on us in this sure, movie? Sure, Okay, that scene, that scene is probably the most realistic scene out of any of their scenes because he's being weird and kind of coming on to her, and she's like, uh, no. She literally says, don't look at me like that. It makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> right, because and, I, I knew you when you were a five-year-old, and I was whatever she was supposed to be. Uh, and the age difference has just been eliminated in this movie. Yeah, and it's like the entire – his entire character is written like a, a 15-year-old kid who doesn't know how to handle his hormones. Right. Which, which like I said – if that's what they were going for, like uh, in an isolated thing, that's actually really interesting. Because if you're thinking about, like, oh well, he's he's now basically a monk and he doesn't really know how to deal with this stuff, so yep. it's blah 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 blah. But that's not what they're doing. He, <clears throat> I don't know why she falls in love with him at all. No, no, I, and I mean he, he's clearly shown himself, and this it ties into that. He's clearly shown himself to be someone who very dearly thinks about people he never sees like he you know his mother is one thing but pa- he hasn't <laughs> He's seen pa- he hasn't seen padme <laughs> in like 15 years it doesn't make any goddamn sense why he feels this way and his, yeah him coming on to her so strongly he never does anything heroic in front of her 
Right. There's never any scene where he like saves a child or does anything, and she's like, "Oh, what a what a true hero." His scenes are he's flipping out about Obi Wan, throwing shit around his workshop, and then he uh, gets all bitchy and whiny when she, as like a queen or whatever, says, "We're gonna go here," and he's like, "I'm in charge of security. I tell you where to go." It's it's yeah, horrible. It's it's really weird. It's really clingy, and it's like <laughs> it just kind of sends a horrible message. It really because does, yeah. he's he's so awful and he's so negative and like these scenes that are supposed to be like them getting really close to each other and falling in love are him saying I think about you all the time <laughs> <laughs> and it makes I have such a gigantic pulsing boner I don't know what to do with it That's, and her response is like it I, torments me <laughs> and her response is like I feel the same way I'm falling in love with you it's like what <laughs> I die a little bit ever since I saw you again or whatever that line is. Yeah. It's so fucking weird. Yeah. yeah, you're you're right though. It's like if if that was the plan to have Amidala, you know, a broken person so that she would fall with for somebody like that, like whatever, but jo- Lucas is totally unaware of that. He thinks that this is like a cool love story. Yes. Yeah. He he's such a badass. There's no reason why she wouldn't want to fall in love with this guy. <laughs> like he's clearly the greatest person. Uh, you know, at least five people have mentioned in 45 minutes how he's supposed to be the greatest Jedi in the world. So he's clearly on pace. I mean, that, that's their relationship. I mean, it has to happen. They're going to they're going to force it to happen. It's just really the pair scene is oh, horrible. Right. OK, perfect. <laughs> perfect example of something I, uh, that we were saying of like uh, unnecessary stuff in this movie that that scene with the pair. And the following scene, which is, you know, a very lustily lit fireside thing where they oh, both yeah. talk about how passionate they are. That could have been the same scene. Yes. There's no reason that you have to see them watch eating fucking dinner in, <laughs> in the, the drawing room. A very the, long table. Yeah. I, mm. ugh, it's like uh, I, this whole movie just feels like a giant commercial for ILM. Yeah. I, and it's it, – nah, anyway. But back to – the relationship is – like, and at the end, when, uh, Dave, what were you saying about them getting married? Oh, I was just saying that Lucas is a, he's a total pussy. Like, he can't, he can't just have them fuck, right? <laughs> right. To create Luke and Leia. He can't do that. They have to get married. Like, George, we know where babies come from. You don't have to show a goddamn <laughs> wedding scene. Just imply that they fuck. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah, the door shutting and R2 standing guard outside <laughs> right, or that's something. That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> I and, actually I actually liked the not the wedding scene but I liked the uh conflicting images at the end like they show yeah. the, the Republic army being built and they show Palpatine sort of standing on his balcony as everyone shakes their head in disgust at what the world has become and then they cut to Anakin in a moment of bliss for him which makes total sense because he needs to only care about her at this point yeah. for the story to make any sense so I like that clash that they do but the wedding is uh, like to have it be such a formal ceremony doesn't make any sense to me. No. I, don't, like, I don't need. I don't need that. There's yeah. there's a level of um, of sneaking around that they say they're gonna do that they never actually do uh, to, to hide their relationship. You mean? Or? Yeah. Like I feel like it would have been much more interesting if instead of just having them get married at the end and be like, oh, clearly they've figured out a way to make this work. Um, they kind of get into some of the I guess, I guess maybe they do it in the next one but I wish I wish they had gotten into this idea that these two are in love but they're being pulled apart by their various commitments yep and you know so they have to do more sneaking around and it's it's a little bit more star-crossed than just now we're getting married and I have a robot hand right I mean Lucas even took the the stakes down a little bit where she like took a new job to be with him you know she doesn't even have to be queen anymore she's just I, I work part time as a senator on the side and Jar Jar uh, does most of the stuff for me so you know whatever Ugh, Jar Jar uh, did, that- you, did you like the it was almost so subtle I was surprised like Jar Jar taking the initiative well he well people are clearly trying to mislead him into doing mm-hmm. it and then mm-hmm. him actually doing it was I kind of enjoyed that actually I think that that's <laughs> somewhat clever I suppose on some level but what I noticed in this time around in that scene it's really really stupid because this so when they're in that like uh, small chamber discussing how to do it the big blue guy with the horns makes some comment like we need an army my 
God, I wish we had a senator brave enough to suggest that. Yep. If only Amidala were around. And then it cuts right to them in the Senate chamber. Jar Jar makes his speech, and everybody in the Senate chamber is like, fuck yeah! <laughs> yeah! I don't want to do this! There seems to be, that why, there, there was no need for the secrecy. Just any senator seemed willing to just stand there and go, we should have an army, and everyone will just cheer and jump and go crazy for it. Yeah, it's... And also, I remember the first time I saw it thinking, oh, that's actually kind of awesome that the uh, the dissolution of the Republic starts with Jar Jar because he's such a fucking idiot. Yep. But then, then the more I thought about it in later years, I was like, no, that's terrible. That that adds <laughs> that adds so much weight to such a garbage character. Yeah. And like, yeah. isn't it much more interesting if if like <clears throat> this is a decision that they come to as a Senate and as a collective? Right. Like, or is was Palpatine's entire plan? I'm gonna set this war in motion. And then everything that happens after that hinges on Jar Jar. <laughs> as long as we make sure Jar Jar's in that secret room where the blue guy is going to start yelling about the army. Make sure yeah, he's standing there in the background. Because let's let's assume let's assume that uh, um, uh, Amidala is not on whatever vision quest she's on. I forget what the hell she's even doing. Yep. But and she's there. Is he going to hinge his future on? Amidala agreeing to give him an army or agreeing to give him supreme executive power or is yeah. the entire plan uh, which brings me back I don't know what the catalyst is if the catalyst is killing Amidala that makes sense because then she's out of the way and I guess theoretically Jar Jar would take her place would, would he I don't know is <laughs> don't it like who, does the blue guy get a, a promotion if she dies I don't know what the power structure is not that it's super necessary but for the sake of something like this I feel like you should have an idea right you are, yeah. in, in a movie in a movie about the president and the president being in having his life in danger, you always know who the the, the vice president is. Yeah, it's, um, it's amazing. I mean, I, I don't think that the assassination of Amadeli is even connected to Palpatine, unfortunately. But I mean, that would make sense if you were to somehow tie it in, because I, I, I do feel her her assassination is only a trade federation obsession, mm -hmm. and I, I don't understand what the point of really keeping them around was. But they they obviously like the funny accent that they do, um, and they're kept but, on. But yeah, it's just the kind of thing where it's like the actual mechanics don't make it don't make sense. It's right. like it's like he was sitting around or thinking about this, and he's like, "All right, so I need someone to give Palpatine supreme executive power." And then someone like across the room said, "Oh, why don't why have Jar Jar do it?" And he's like, "Yeah, let's have Jar Jar do it. Let's bring him." I, I think Luke. What Lucas is saying is that the 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 most evil dark side trait is fake humility. Because yeah. Palpatine couldn't just stand up and be like, hey, I'll, I'll do it. Because everyone just probably would have applauded that and been like, yeah, we'll have you do it. You seem to be on top of it. He has this, Palpatine spends the entire movie sort of fake humility of like, oh, I don't, I don't really want this. Like, uh, just, uh, you know, what, oh, I'll do it, but yeah, whatever. Or, or basically, you know that the scene where they stand around saying that shit about, oh, I wish someone was brave enough to do blah, blah, blah. Why don't you just have that scene in the Senate? Right. Mm -hmm. And so Palpatine says this to everybody where he's like, we need to do something about this. We need someone who gets supreme executive power. I'm not going to be that man. It's not up to me. It's not my thing. Yeah. And have that humility actually work in his favor because then everyone, you know, it's like an arrested development. Anytime that Lucille talks about being a terrible mother, they're like, no, you're not a terrible <laughs> right. mother. Yeah. Like yeah. it's that kind of that kind of uh, reverse psychology that at least seems a little bit more interesting because then you've got everybody being like, no. We're going to get – they're choosing to give him the power instead right. of Jar Jar just saying, like, I think we should give it to him. <laughs> I, I love this movie. I think it's so good. <laughs> it's such, a, such an awesome movie. I love when Amidala falls out of the plane at the end and seems okay. Uh, that's really oh, exciting. Dude, people in this movie fall from great heights and do not even get a scratch on them. Yeah. They're they, not, they're not very concerned about it. I was saying to Dave, the scene in, during that uh, the the, the high-speed chase when Anakin launches himself over the side of the car and falls like, I don't know, 900 feet. Yep. And 900. Grabs onto and the, way <laughs> longer than that. He's fallen for minutes. He was in the stratosphere. Yeah, he basically, and, he and basically jumps, jumps out of a plane. And he lands on a car. I was saying he should land on the car. They should cut to black. And then the next scene should be him on the table being plugged into the Darth Vader suit. <laughs> This is how it went down. Well, I mean, you have to give Lucas some credit. He did he did drop his lightsaber when he hit the car. So it's not as if he's a superhuman on all levels, I suppose. So the let's other... talk. I think the last thing before we wrap it up will be um, we've talked about all of the lightsaber fights. So I think we might as well talk about the lightsaber fights in this one. Um, 
There's so many. Yeah, there's. I guess there's so only really tips. there's only really two, unless you're very generous with how uh, what is called a lightsaber fight. Um, That's true. I'll just go with the Dooku. Both all phases of the Dooku fight at the very end. Uh, we'll talk about that one. Okay, so I love uh, when the cool part of it is when Anakin is fighting Dooku because it it cuts it ties in from uh, it, it alludes to Empire Strikes Back so well because they cut the lights so it's in the darkness so you kind of just see the glow of the lightsaber on their faces and it's red and blue mm-hmm. and it just it really really works so I really love that part and then Yoda comes in and ruins everything. Yep. Is his walking stick just a lie? Is that just a ruse for everyone? <laughs> it's just a ruse. I, I do want to talk about I, I thought that the I think that the I actually prefer the Phantom Menace fight on a like a thematic level as to what yeah. it means. Um I don't think this fight has anything going for it. There's nothing being spelled out. I was thinking that they do the lighting thing, which is as Clay was saying, it was clear to clearly hide that it's uh Mr. Lee is not who he seems to be. Um I would have changed it to somehow have Anakin pick up a red lightsaber Ooh, so that the red yeah. glow is on his face at that yeah, point. Yeah, that'd be good. I don't know how they would have done it, but instead it's him. You in, should write the movie. Should, <laughs> <laughs> instead it's him in blue, and it doesn't make sense to me. And then Yoda comes in and just gives the him and du, <laughs> him and Dooku stand and point at each other for about five minutes, and it's interminable. It's, it's like it, Dooku and Yoda fighting is like watching the, uh, you know when you don't press start in a fighting game, and it goes through a computer versus computer thing? Yep. <laughs> and it's always like at the highest skill level. That's what watching that fight is like. Uh, Dooku it's like sends... nothing, nothing but shurikens and <laughs> like lightning blasts and... and As the guy just jumps and cuts. falls into it. Yeah, the, the, I, he throws some metal tins at him and then he knocks some rocks on him and Yoda blocks it all and then he absorbs some lightning and then uh, Dooku says well you know fuck the force let's just let's just do it right here with some lightsabers and Yoda obliges him um, I will say it's sheerly because the movie is so boring that I do get a little excited when Yoda uses his little, his little uh, lightsaber reveal it's a terrible idea it's like completely against the character I will um, say that the reveal shot is probably the best camera work in the, all three of those movies. It's the very best like, of both worlds. He should, he should have, they yeah. should have just played the, uh, the best I, I of guess I'm just, movies. I guess I'm just a sucker for uh, the camera circling around people <laughs> dramatically, which might be why I love Bad Boys 2 so much. Um, <laughs> but the, it's, it's like a really, I mean, clearly he knows that this is an important moment. I feel like this is something that's lost in a lot of movies now. Uh, this is a, I don't want to go off on a huge tangent, but I feel like, the Batman, Batman versus Superman, and even Man of Steel have this problem where you have these big moments, but they're shot really boringly. Yeah. So they don't have the power they should. But in this moment, yeah, he, Yoda has never held a lightsaber ever. In you know, I think we agree here with good reason. Right. But they think the people making this movie think this is something people are going to want to see. So we really have to lean into it. So they do this really nice camera move where they kind of push in and they do this nice kind of half turn, like you said, best of both worlds. And then he pulls the lightsaber out. It's a nice move. The thing that occurred to me though, you can't even give Lucas credit for that because that was done entirely in a fucking computer. Yes. So whoever did that is the person who animated that scene. <laughs> they they nailed, nailed that animation aspect. I know it's, Picture I, Lucas, Lucas blocking it out for some programmers. <laughs> like, I want it to be like this. <laughs> Spinning around. No, His lightsaber's so tiny. It's tiny. That, He's tiny. That, <laughs> that brings up a good point about this entire movie. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, I'll, we'll get back to that when we kind of kind of wrap it up. But to, to talk about the fight still. Um, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, go ahead, sir. Well, I mean. I, 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 didn't, I didn't really know where I was going to go. So no, you can he's, continue. I, I just, I feel like there's a, there's a way... You can. I, I'd agree that I don't want to see a Yoda with a lightsaber. There's a way to do it with the character that makes a little bit more sense. Like I can think of like the ending of the Matrix scene where Neo realizes he's the one and he's fighting at like a hundred times the, the speed of the agents. You mm-hmm. know, like everything's very easy for him. Mm-hmm. They don't do that. They have Yoda well, they, leaping I mean, they, around. That's kind of what he does. I mean, he does kind of fighting fast. Uh, <clears throat> the thing that bothers me is. There's no, um, this kind of goes, this happens in the lightsaber fights, but this happens throughout everything in these movies is that there's no, it's all very, uh, homogenized and flat. So 
everybody has the exact same fighting style, no matter who they are or how old they are yep. or what their story or character says to uh, uh, to the contrary. And even like if you it, I was watching this, I'm thinking about all the different worlds that they're showing, and all of these worlds are populated the like exact same amount. Yeah. You know, there's always the same amount of robots and the same amount of people walking across the screen in every single shot. Like yeah. the when they go into the diner, it's you got to make sure there's robots going across the screen and people walking into deep focus so you can, uh, you know, show that there's uh, there's depth to the screen. Yep. And when they go to Tatooine, you're in Tatooine, and oh, the, it's a lively community. It's like every every in the script, every description for these places is exterior Tatooine, a lively community. Yeah, a exterior bustling, exterior bustling Coruscant, a lively community. You know, it's <laughs> and it's the same with the fighting because if you've got Dooku, who's like this, this will come into play even have more heavily in the next movie. But you've got Dooku, who's this big uh, 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 dark side user, and Yoda, who's like the supreme lord of the the light side, right? Why do they fight the exact same fucking way? Right. Yeah. Why does Yoda fight the same way that Anakin fights? Why doesn't? Why hasn't Yoda moved past that? Like in every single kung fu movie there has ever been that has a master and a student in it, the master is always the guy who can beat you with, like, his finger or, mm -hmm. like, one move or, you know, can can think you to death or something. Like, there's – they've risen above hand-to-hand -hand combat. And I don't understand why Yoda doesn't do the same thing, especially especially when the, the, the difference between the dark side – I mean, I'm going on for a while here, but no, no, the difference right. between the dark side and the light side seems to be the dark side is all about – fucking pounding shit away and just blunt force trauma and the light side is all about being very you know calm and centered and zen that should be reflected in the fighting styles of the supreme overlord of the dark side and the supreme master of the light side yeah i i, I think the i think one of the biggest failures like you're saying of the lightsaber fights is that the thematically what their sort of ethos is is not carried out in how they fight each other yeah it, it, i'm going to spoil it now but I hate the final fight scene because Obi-Wan draws his lightsaber first when he's fighting Anakin Ooh. in the fire pits. It makes no That's fucking interesting. sense. Yeah, good call. Like, so why do they do that? It, it, Lucas just doesn't seem to understand the like the philosophy of these two groups. And yeah. it, it makes no sense to me. Well, and that would make, you know, that it's stupid. But it, that makes Anakin charging in against Dooku make more thematic sense. Because the right. Jedi would want to hang back and let them come to them. Anakin is more of a dark side sort of sensitive because he's more willing to go at people. Yeah. And right. they just, they ruin it. So to, to jump off what Clay was saying, I just want to mention that like, and I, I, we, I re recently re-listened to the, uh, the Phantom Menace podcast we did, and I was wrong that um, I said that they were all cartoons made for people young enough that they couldn't read. That's, that was, but that's just Phantom Menace. Like, who is Attack of the Clones made for? Attack of the Clones was made for the easiest audience possible. It was made for the, the type of fan that couldn't dislike Star Wars. Like, no matter what yeah. he did, there's so many winks and nods. And, and I think that that, f that lightsaber full, uh, fight got into it, too. Like, they, they mentioned Yoda being the best sword master, and then they show you Yoda fighting, and they don't do it in a cool or interesting at all way. They're doing it just... Because you want to see Yoda with a lightsaber. You, you, did, you don't want to see Yoda as if he was on a character in Super Smash Brothers? <laughs> <laughs> right. He's hammering now that down. You bring it up, actually, the Obi Wan Jango Fett fight on top of a platform is very Super Smash Brothers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah, a good that's, point. That's, that's true, actually. He needed to, Obi Wan couldn't double jump up to, uh, yeah, to get up the side. There are rockets, uh, there might be a double jump. And oh, I, the, uh, sorry, the last thing we learned about this one R2 has, uh, R2 can fly. Which is interesting. <laughs> Clay had the best line ever, which he's so right. If at the end of episode three, Jimmy Smith had said, "Wipe these two droids' memory and take the rockets off that one," it would have been <laughs> awesome. <laughs> he's got like a he's got like a burn mark on his face or something from it. Just <laughs> like it, it, take this thing down a notch. Yeah, I had forgotten that uh, C three uh, three PO oh. excuse me gets his mind wiped. I was thinking about that, and I was like, oh yeah, so that does happen. 
We should talk briefly about 3PO because he is the fucking worst in this movie. Oh, God. I and it's uh, the best part to me on the rewatch of the original trilogy was the droids. I think the yeah. droids hold up the best out of anything of those movies, just on like a scene by scene basis. And when you rewatched it, did C three PO like did his joke still land? Did he make you laugh? In the originals, yes. Yeah. They they're yeah, they're, funny. they're timeless in how they interact with each other. And this one three <laughs> PO is kind of an asshole to R2. They, they turn him into like a cat skills comic. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he calls R2 an idiot at one point which I was like Jesus that's kind of harsh like as he's chasing him out of the ship and like down into the thing they're just their interaction it felt like Lucas um, it just felt totally disconnected from yeah the originals and the, the uh, Force Awakens they bring it back and they actually nail that dynamic between them all well I was I was thinking it would have been really interesting if they again this would require making a uh, interesting choice and not just showing more of what you think people want to see. But if if they had given, um, if they had made R two and C three PO's relationship different, like if they had them work really well together, or so, right. like something, <laughs> yeah. something implying that after they get their minds wiped, when they meet each other again, it's a different situation, and they they're just you know jerks to each other like they are in the originals. Like why not do something different so it's oh. I mean, is that too is is that too winky? I don't know. Well, well it, yeah. I mean, you could flip it around. Have three PO buy into all of R two's suggestions in the prequels and have them be wrong or something, so that R two kind of seems like he's learning as he gets like moves along in it or something. But I, I don't know if you'd have to go that way. But you could definitely change their dynamic because the way they are in the original makes sense is because they're old friends. You know what yeah. I mean? This are one, they? I guess uh, they are. I don't know. For some reason, I, I could I could never determine if they had if they were old friends or if they they, they just were, met each other. Yeah, if their uh, um, relationship was due to them being forced together the way that they were. Oh, okay, I'd like to think that they were old friends and maybe just yeah. don't, don't treat like, them that way in the prequels. They're like an old an old married couple, basically. Right. Yeah, I guess it depends on what part of three PO's memory was wiped. Right? Does he forget yeah. about R two? I I think so. R two remembers know. three PO question. though, right? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so yeah, think, sure. Whatever. We're going to call it a day there. Uh, guys, thank you very much for coming on and talking Star Wars with me. Well, uh, can I talk about one more thing before yeah, we wrap absolutely. up? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Because this, this really stood out to me. Because uh, um, I was trying to go into this. I didn't want to be super negative. I wanted to find something interesting and something positive to talk about. And the thing that really stood out to me overall is that this is the most stylish Star Wars movie of the original six. In that, like, there's no other shot in any of the Star Wars movies that's like that scene where Amidala is sleeping and they're put, bringing the light from the city in yeah. through the blinds. It's, 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 a very, it's a very different kind of style to everything else that came before it, and even arguably after it. Yeah. And even the city of Coruscant is very different. It's you know very neon. It's very, it's kind of like a cross between uh, uh, like Blade Runner and uh, uh, like Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. Or yeah, something. I felt it, it, I felt it was like a cyberpunk meets noir type. Yeah, feel and they, it's a very it's a very different feel and a very different look. And I was kind of like, oh, I actually have to give him a little bit of credit for pushing it this far, but. The thing again, like I said about the um, the the camera move on Yoda, I think I think basically this entire movie was just people building stuff in the computer, and then him going, "Yeah, it looks pretty good." Yeah, like I I don't I don't know how much like was he how much of the how many of those shots or how much of the look of that city was he like describing to people or did he just have a room full of amazing artists and be like, "I want a, a planet that's a city." And right. then you know, it's cars. It's got jets and cars everywhere. Yeah, he's got. Then he then he comes up. They come. They each come up with five ideas. So he's got like fifty ideas on the board, and he goes like this one, like that one, and like that one, and build it. Like, yep. and it really took. It, it really kind of undercut it even more for me. And but then I was thinking, all right, <clears throat> this movie came out in two thousand two. It's kind of groundbreaking in the amount of CGI he uses, and I know that I I, I hate it. But there was no other movie, I thought, at that time, aside from Sky Captain, that had really gone, you know, all in yeah. on CGI, right? I was like, all right. So he basically was pre predicting the way movies were going to be made for the next 15 years or something. But then I looked it up, and 
also coming out that year were uh, Lord of the Rings: The Two Towers, <laughs> the second or uh, the second or third Harry Potter movie, and the first Spider Man movie, and Men in Black too. And I was like, oh my god, he's not even like at the forefront of anything because these other movies are already doing it better. Yeah, yeah, and I haven't seen a lot of those, but I don't. I wonder which of those would hold up the best. I started to see the age of this one. Um, yeah. on this watch is like ooh that yeah that doesn't look quite as good as I remember it looking. I'm, it's so like those those backgrounds of like interiors are garbage. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, you Even can the see the first can... time they fly into Coruscant it looks really bad. Yep. Mm-hmm. The sh- the shiny ship it's almost too shiny and it yeah. it, it right. looked like the uh, the rendering is like they shouldn't have made it so shiny to make it look more realistic. Yeah, and yeah. even the, the the buildings popping up out of the clouds it just looked like poop. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like the, and all of the interiors, you can basically see the green screen, or like the the shots. So much fucking walking in this movie, and it's just to show off that they can do like dynamic camera movements around live actors in a CGI environment. Yeah. So everybody has to be walking down a giant unpopulated hallway. Yes. And, and it's just and you, and you notice that they put objects into the scene away from where they walk if that makes yes. sense like they, yeah, they no. walk perfectly through things and then they put like flower vases uh, on the side that they don't touch and yep. it's very yeah. noticeable and it was that much more that's why it stood out to me that much more when they go back to naboo and they're actually on a location yeah you know well, it, that, it, that naboo set is is kind of cool actually i kind of like that the uh the, yeah. the little like veranda thing that they have or or even um what is it uh the uh, Owen Owen Lars's place. I mean, that's obviously from the original, but I mean, it stands out so much yep. when you have actually on a set. Yeah, yeah. Can we just mention? I don't remember episode three that well, but what stuck out to me about Owen and Baru, and we haven't brought this up, is Obi Wan never meets Owen and Baru. Does he? Does he in the third one? Like, how the hell does he know to give the kids to these people? Does someone tell him? Does I don't know. never in never in this movie. No, do, does Amidala on her deathbed say what to do with them or something? <laughs> well, after she names them, she's like, wait, <laughs> hold on, take them to if, Lars. If you have to give these kids away, give them to Anakin's Anakin's stepbrother, <laughs> Amidala. Don't you think that's a terrible idea? Just do what I say. <laughs> Goodbye, my time here is up. Yeah, that's. I, I don't know. It's I, I didn't want to be too. Ne- I don't think we were overly <laughs> negative. I think it's a horrific movie. I think it's terrible. Um, I think we treated it fairly. Yeah, I think we. we <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, yeah, I, I was charging in, and uh, you guys lightning bolt me into the wall, and I just uh, I just sit there for a while. Is it is it is there any one thing you can point to, or is it really a basically just a a, a car crash? Amy Amy was like she was walking in and out. She doesn't give a fuck about this, so she wasn't really watching it. But I was watching it, and she she goes. Uh, She's like, oh, she's like, this doesn't look too good. I was like, no. She's like, so what? Uh, what went wrong? Like, why? Why is this one not good? I could not explain. I was just like, everything's just wrong about it. Like, I couldn't come up with a one reason to explain. Like, well, they kind of fucked up the Anakin story, and that didn't really work, and that kind of set everything off. But it, it's really, if you describe to someone what's wrong with this, you can touch on virtually everything. Yeah. Like, does does it work better? Let's say they have a different actor playing Anakin. And you actually buy the relationship. Does that fix the movie enough that it it works? No. If he's reading the same dialogue, I don't think that any actor can really make that character seem correct. Yeah. Because th- even that if he's wearing like a third of the makeup that Hay- Hayden Christensen <laughs> oh, wears, yeah. why does he wear so much makeup? Or a third like, of that uh, uh, rat tail or whatever that that bizarre decision <laughs> to include that thing on his side of his head. Anakin's Anakin's missing the scene that makes you buy why he's all sad. Yeah. There's no scene that does that. Everyone seems very nice to him. The Jedi give him a lot of opportunities. Um, and he's he's meeting the love of his life. Uh, everything's yeah. coming up roses for him. There's just no... Uh, for all the, the... I mean, I know part of it is that he's just delusional, I guess. But there's no... For all the whining he does about people stopping him from doing stuff, when do they actually stop him from doing something he wants to do? Right, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, Obi Wan no. at the end, and it's because it's idiotic to go. Like he, he's like, well, you got to fight in this lightsaber battle up here, buddy. Yeah, like not, not even again. Putting Yoda, putting him as as uh, Amidala's protector is asinine. Mm-hmm. Why don't they have a scene there where he's making his case, or you know, being like, oh, uh, well, Obi Wan can't do it, so I should probably, you know, like, why right. not have him? 
be active in something instead of just I don't know it's have it be given to him I could I, yeah it, yeah it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense his character just comes arc off is completely as, broken he just comes off as a whiny entitled prick yeah basically yeah, yeah to, to people who are being pretty decent to him. Yeah, they are. They're being pretty good. I mean, they're teaching you how to use the greatest power in the known universe. Yep. You're being a fucking asshole. About it. <laughs> do you think it's because? Do you think it's because he has to go to the same classes that all those little kids go to? Yeah, he's probably uh, he's probably at that grade level. These or gen something. heads are bullshit. <laughs> the, so I'm going to close this with one question. If you guys want to give me one quick answer, uh, the the scene where. Anakin cuts the pair and gives Amidala half the pair with using the force. He makes it float around. Yep. Do you feel that the Jedi should have been written into that they don't use their powers so obviously and that it's kind of flaunting the Jedi well, code to use the force in such a way? He do- He says that. Oh, does he? Yeah. Uh, Obi- after- oh, he's right. He said Obi-Wan would yell at me or something if I was doing yeah. this. Okay. Yeah, but no, I, I thought the same thing. Uh, that is kind of a flagrant abuse of power right yeah it's just parlor tricks at that point it's this is like their religion they need to have a better grasp of what they're they're if they were going to do that they should have doubled down and had him use the force for like everything (laughs) so be like turning off turning off lights and like you know plugging in his computer what he's tinkering with that thing in the workshop why is he using the force to turn the wrench you know like why, why doesn't he do it all the all the time that tied into the in the Phantom Menace, we were upset that little Anakin never used the Force, never showed you that he actually had a Force yeah. sensibility. Yeah, or have like a moment where he's using the Force to do something while his hands are doing something else, and right. they can be like, or Obi Wan can be like, "Hey, don't do that," and he'll be like, "But I have all this power. I can do stuff with my mind and my hands. I can get twice as much stuff." You know, like some sort, of, just any sort of character. Right. I mean, that would be you could have that scene, and Obi Wan just walks in and he's like, "You know, it never stops amazing me how." diverse your force ability it's some stupid i'll yeah, write it better than like, that but don't, don't he whines and he cries about being the most powerful jedi and he'll be so powerful that he'll be able to bring people back from the dead and the most powerful dis- the most the biggest display of power he does in that movie is he cuts a pair in half <laughs> well it was, a, it was an unright pair clay it took a lot of force power to get through that thing it's but, like i don't know why i have a picture of uh um uh uh Master, Master Shake after he gets all of his uh, um, illegal uh, prosthetics done to his face. Oh no! When he, no, when he comes back uh, as the Highlander and gets struck by lightning, and he's got the googly eyes taped to his forehead. I don't know why that popped into my head, but it's it's thematic. It's appropriate. All right. Well, yeah. we're gonna call it a we're gonna call it a day here. I suppose that'll be it. We got one more of the prequels left, and then we'll have. Yeah, see a, you for the next one. Yeah, see you for the next one. Then we'll follow have the, us. Follow us on Twitter if you'd like to tell us all the reasons why we're wrong about this. If someone could write in like a, a one-page document what the plot of what Palpatine's trying to do, I would appreciate it. Or give me a link or something, something mm-hmm. that explains what's actually going on. But, yeah, thank you guys for listening. If you enjoyed the content, you're on YouTube. Uh, like and a comment's appreciated. This won't be on iTunes, so it'll just have to stick to YouTube. But, yeah. Ooh, YouTube it, exclusive. Yeah, it's a YouTube exclusive. People have been uh, anxiously awaiting our opinion on this one. Really? <laughs> well, a couple people anyway. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see if this makes them happy. I, I, you're you're welcome, <laughs> guys. Thank you very much, and I'll see you later.